Okay, the, the title of my presentation, you will uh, see now why this uh, title is the Challenges of Buen Vivir, uh, Impacts of Extractive Sectors in a Sustainable Development Project in Ecuador. Um, and I will divide my presentation in four sections. I thought it was a good idea to give you a little bit of context about Ecuador. And I will uh, tell you a little bit about the questions um, that... Uh, I had at the beginning of this uh, part of the research and the methods I used in order to answer them. Uh, I will tell you also a little bit of some um, key findings and uh, I will also uh, give you some preliminary conclusions uh, of what I have uh, seen uh, so far. Okay, so um, let me start uh, first um, talking a little bit about um, the biodiversity of Ecuador. Um, Ecuador is a quite small country, however, it's part of a, a mega diverse countries um, and it has um, a huge biodiversity. Uh, its territory encompasses uh, 91 ecosystems with a huge uh, variety of uh, plants, uh, several of them uh, endemic, um, more than 1,600 uh, bird species, 450 species of reptiles, more than uh, 500 of amphibians and more than 900 species of uh, freshwater fish. Uh, furthermore, uh, more than a third of the Ecuadorian territory is located in the Amazon rainforest um, um, region uh, with a huge uh, importance in environmental terms uh, for the planet, as you know. Now, uh, this is not the only um, diversity that characterizes Ecuador, as the country has also a huge cultural diversity. Uh, its population encompasses 14 indigenous nationalities, as well as several Afro-descendant and mestizo peasant communities, all of them with their particular uh, ways of life, uh, worldviews, and uh, social practices. Now. Um, there are a couple of um, things related with political dynamics that will be uh, interested for you to know about Ecuador. Uh, particularly, um, one is uh, that Ecuador has a new constitution that was approved in 2008, and that uh, somehow tried to answer to those two kinds of uh, diversity. Um, first of all, the new constitution recognizes the idea uh, the notion of suma causai, which in Spanish is usually translated as buen vivir or good living in English, as the main collective goal of the Ecuadorian society. This idea of suma causai or buen vivir is seen usually as an alternative uh, to the conventional notion of development and usually refers to a uh, um, virtuous, uh, harmonic inter interaction between human beings and uh, nature. But it also um, includes uh, some ideas and notions about the importance of collective life, which somehow is seen as a um, worldview, as a collective goal, uh, substantially different to uh, the conventional uh, perspective of uh, Western societies. It also included this idea of the rights of nature, uh, which uh, has been seen by several scholars as a manifestation of uh, deep environmentalism, the recognition of nature as a subject of rights as uh, we as human beings are. The third element which is fundamental is the recognition of the plurinational character of the state. Uh, this somehow implies that uh, public policies have somehow to uh, be compatible, not just with the uh, Western uh, um, conventional worldviews, but also um, with the uh, cultures and the uh, worldviews of the different communities that um, constitute the Ecuadorian society. The mixture of those things are a huge challenge for several reasons, but uh, fundamentally because uh, Ecuador is economically reliant on fossil fuel exports 
And unfortunately, most of those uh, of its oil reserves are located in the Amazon rainforest, <laughs> and furthermore, uh, mostly under indigenous territories. Now, uh, in 2009, one year after the approval of the constitution, the um, state and the um, public planning, uh, planning institution published a national development plan that uh, sought to address those challenges. Uh, this was called the uh, first national plan for good living. Um, and it was um, followed uh, four years later with a second plan, which, which followed basically the same, uh, the same uh, general idea. This was issued by the Rafael Correa administration that uh, stayed in power uh, until uh, 2017, which means that uh, the, the, this administration has two uh, presidential terms, eight years, for implementing at least some of the general policies included in the plan, something which allowed us to see, uh, to evaluate uh, somehow um, how uh, was this process of implementation and what, which was the feasibility and the challenges of the proposals included there. Something which worth to mention, uh, to, to be mentioned, is also that uh, all this happened in the middle of the most recent commodities boom, uh, which gave, at least during the first stage of the government, some um, um, extra um, public budget for implementing uh, uh, the plan. <clears throat> now, um, my questions and the methods I use. Basically, the main uh, questions I have at the beginning were, uh, were, first, which were the main features of this uh, development plan? The second one, uh, how was its process of implementation? Uh, methodologically, basically what I did was qualitative and quantitative analysis, mostly qualitative, but I included some uh, quantitative elements, uh, um, over policy documents and official databases, and this was complemented with secondary sources. Uh, I look at, uh, at two uh, dimensions, first the plan in itself, and then some elements uh, that I consider the key from its process of implementation. Uh, public investment trends, productive transformation policies, and extractive sector policies, uh, the later connected with uh, biodiversity, which is key for reasons you will see uh, in the next slides. Now, um, well, basically, the key elements of the plan um, were first that uh, the plan aimed to a post-petroleum Ecuador, uh, which was conceived as an eco-tourist biopolis, which is a, an idea probably um, linked with some um, political philosophical notions. Um, two things are important here. The first, uh, that the, the plan starts with a diagnosis about the negative effects of extractivism and particularly oil extraction in the country, uh, not just uh, environmental, but also social, political, uh, negative impacts. And uh, therefore, the plan uh, suggested the idea of uh, looking for a different uh, kind of national economy. Um, the idea it was precisely this uh, ecotourist biopolis, which was not other thing than uh, the identification of the country's biodiversity as its main comparative advantage and a proposal for using um, in a, sust a sustainable way this biodiversity with the development of sectors like ecotourism, biotechnology, biopharmaceuticals, and so on. Um, I try to represent here how um, this idea was connected with several SDGs, um, fundamentally trying to um, achieve a virtuous relationship between the uh, uh, objectives 8 and uh, 15. Um, but it also included, uh, included other uh, SDGs, uh, fundamentally to the extent that those were a high value added um, services that usually require high, high levels of uh, um, technology and scientific, and, uh, scientific knowledge. It was related with uh, uh, the fourth and the ninth, and because it uh, showed um, the overcoming this uh, dependence that the country has uh, uh, of um, oil exports, it was also related with uh, the objective related with climate, climate action. Now, um, here is a graph which is actually from the plan that describes the different phases that the country was supposed to uh, cross in order to achieve this 
um, ecotourist biopolis. Um, well, generally, you can see here uh, how the first stage was basically um, focused on um, the classical, traditional um, uh, import substitution, basically, which is a um, traditional way to uh, develop the national industrial sector. Uh, the second stage uh, continued with this, but it also included the uh, development of a uh, tourist sector. And the third and the fourth phases uh, were re more related with the development of precisely those sectors uh, related with biodiversity and uh, knowledge, biotechnology and, and so on. Well, um, here you can see how uh, each of those stages had approximately four years for its development. So although one cannot um, judge or evaluate uh, the um, Korea administration uh, for its uh, possibilities for developing the entire plan, one can at least see to which extent it was able to um, uh, make progress in the decent uh, with relation to, to, the, to the first two stages. Now, let's uh, first have a look to what happened uh, regarding public investment. Okay, here in this slide, you can see uh, the behavior of three fundamental variables. First of all, you can see how uh, from the uh, 2010, one year after the beginning of the, of, of the publication, sorry, of the plan, you can see how there is a sustained increase in public investment which start to be uh, reduced from 2013 onwards. As some of you may know, this year is the year uh, in which uh, the um, um, oil international prices uh, substantially decreased. And as you can see here, this had an impact in the uh, general uh, income of, sorry, the oil related state income. Um, however, you can see that uh, the reduction of uh, the public investment is not as dramatic as uh, it uh, could have been, and this was partially the result of uh, the increase of the public debt. Now, here you can see the behavior of the public uh, debt that uh, can help us to understand this in the uh, proper context. Here first, you can see a substantial reduction of the uh, debt of the country, which was basically the result of a quite successful uh, debt uh, renegotiation at the beginning of the Korea administration that uh, gave the state uh, some air that was precisely used to um, uh, soften the worst effects of the um, oil international prices decrease. However, and this is also uh, important to mention, the Constitution of 2008 included a um, ceiling for the country indebtedness, which was approximately the 40% of the uh, national GDP, which was something that by then was almost reached by um, the state. Now, um, very, this is a general um, characterization of how the money uh, was used, the investment uh, public budget. Uh, this, in, in this graph, this is divided uh, by the different sectors in which the uh, state administration was uh, divided by them. You can see here how um, investment was particularly concentrated in three areas, uh, strategic sectors, production, employment, and competitiveness, and social development. Those are not uh, areas that I um, established, but this is uh, how um, um, it was defined by the public administration by, by then. And um, despite it's not that easy to know exactly uh, which kind of um, investment projects were uh, um, financed, because you have a huge uh, um, number of um, investment projects by year, uh, it was possible to establish that at least 70% of the uh, money used in a strategic sector was used for other electric power and electricity infrastructure. More than 40% was of uh, the budget of the production sector was used for transport infrastructure, and more than 50% of the social development budget was used for housing, health, and early childhood care. Now, uh, it's worth to mention that, as you can see, the fourth uh, um, sector was knowledge and human talent, 
uh, which uh, in the plan was considered a key sector because, as I mentioned before, the uh, uh, sectors of biotechnology, biopharmaceuticals, and so on are intensive in uh, knowledge. Uh, and it is well known that uh, the Correa administration invested uh, a lot of money in higher education, science, and technology. So one can say that Ecuador invested a good proportion of its oil income on infrastructure and social services. This included uh, fundamentally human capital, but also uh, specifically um, higher education, as I just mentioned. Uh, that the state dampened the effects of the fall in the oil prices through growing public debt. Also that uh, this was possible thanks to the debt negotiation carried out during the first years of the Correa administration. And finally, that by 2017, the state was reaching the limits of this strategy, which was not so sustainable in the uh, middle uh, term. Okay, now um, let's talk a little bit about productive transformation policies. This is a broad category, but uh, I, I had a look basically at the policies related with the uh, development of uh, basically industrial or higher value added value-added uh, sectors. And uh, it's possible to say that uh, productive transformation policies corresponded mostly to protectionist uh, measures. Uh, notably, the country refused to sign uh, free trade agreements for a decade. And this is um, um, quite important because uh, during the, the 10 years uh, that the Korea administration lasted, uh, most of the Andean countries uh, signed uh, free trade agreements with the United States or with the Europe, European Union. What happened with Ecuador is that during that period, Ecuador negotiated with the uh, European Union, but it just uh, signed the FTA at the end of the administration in 2017. That means that during, the, during 10 years, uh, the country didn't have a free trade agreement. From 2008 onwards, the state also implemented some tariff measures to protect specific sectors. And furthermore, for, from 2013 onwards, uh, with the fall of the oil prices, it also implemented some non-tariff measures to protect the trade balance. Um, this is basically the, the package, let's call it, uh, of uh, protectionist measures uh, used by the administration. However, the administration failed in the task of designing focalized policies on sector selection dynamics, which are fundamental uh, for developing uh, industrial policies, uh, which was a huge uh, shortcoming in the um, uh, implementation process of the plan. Now, here you can see the results in terms of um, import dynamics of those policies. There are no substantial changes. You can see just two uh, uh, that were to mention. One is basically the decrease of mineral products import, which is uh, actually a um, monetary decrease uh, related with the end of the commodities boom. And here you can see um, um, good results of uh, um, those protection is measured specifically with uh, transport uh, materials. Um, this is uh, maybe related to further uh, research has to be done, but uh, um, everything seems to indicate that this is related with uh, some um, quotas uh, established uh, for imports of ensembled vehicles that uh, uh, um, helped the um, automobile sector in Ecuador during several, uh, during several years, but uh, this was ended with the uh, signing of the uh, trade agreement with the European Union in 2017. Something similar happens with uh, exports. There was no diversification. There is just a slight, very, very small changes uh, in the, the uh, proportion of vegetal products, but this is mostly related with the decrease of the international oil prices. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about destructive sector policies, which are considered are, are key for uh, evaluating uh, the implementation of the plan. And let me start mentioning that uh, in general terms regarding oil, uh, the country uh, followed a twofold strategy. On one hand, in 2007, the Ecuadorian state launched the Yasuni ITT initiative. Maybe some of you heard about this um, proposal, which was uh, quite innovative uh, by then. 
that proposes to leave the oil reserves uh, located on the, um, on the a mega diverse area of the Amazon unexploited. This was uh, approximately the 25% of the country's oil reserves in exchange for an economic compensation from the international community. However, at the same time, it launched uh, the 11th oil round, which was a binding process over the remaining oil reserves of the Amazon Southeast. Until then, oil exploitation area covered 32% of the Ecuadorian Amazon, with the 11th round uh, being uh, um, increased in a 36%. Uh, in 2013, the Ecuadorian state declared the end of the Yasuni ITT initiative, arguing insufficient international contribution. It is true that uh, the uh, goals of um, money collection was, were, were not achieved by far. Now, here you can see the um, expansion uh, that this uh, 11th round uh, represented. Uh, you can see the, those pointing, pointed squares uh, are the, the um, um, uh, blocks which were already under exploitation, and uh, those with diagonal lines are uh, those which were uh, included with the 11th round. And you see the, you can see here also the impact in biodi biodiversity, which is a uh, huge. Biodiversity was already quite um, affected at the beginning of the uh, administration uh, because the exploitation basically of those um, um, oil blocks in the north, but this extended to the south. Now, uh, two things were to mention here. One, that the initial strategy of the government was to protect one area which was uh, um, which had a, a high biodiversity concentration and to exploit uh, that, uh, the, the area of the south basically thinking in a sort of exchange, uh, one thing uh, for the other one. But uh, um, this is probably not the best strategy because we are talking about different ecosystems, so um, um, uh, types of biodiversity which are not uh, exchangeable, uh, the ones for the other. As you can see, uh, yeah, both areas uh, have um, a high level of biodiversity. Now, uh, that was not just a uh, threatening of um, biological diversity. It was also um, endangering the uh, cultural diversity of the country to the extent that uh, practically all the oil blocks which were included in the 11th round were uh, located over uh, indigenous territories. Here in this map, you can see how um, um, there are several um, indigenous territories located there, uh, and all of them have a high levels of um, um, affectation, even to the 100%, more than 90% in most of the cases. Uh, something similar happened with the expansion of the mining frontier. Uh, from 2008 to 2016, the Ecuador continental surface uh, grew uh, under concession grew from 4.5 to 13 uh, percent. And uh, one of the main uh, changes in uh, mining policy was uh, the uh, beginning of mega mining operations, few of them located in a very sensible area, the Cordillera del Condor, which is a biodiversity hotspot that shelters several species of amphibian, birds, and reptiles. And uh, uh, this includes several species that we don't know yet about. A recent studies found 20 new species of plants, 41 of frogs, two of reptiles. It is calculated that each hectare of the Cordillera hosts 220 species of trees. As it was the case with the expansion of the oil frontier, the mining frontier also occurred over a traditional indigenous territory. Now here you can see um, the, the location precisely of those uh, three mega mining uh, um, operations over the uh, Cordillera del Condor. But here you can see how there are huge um, uh, mining operations that are located either uh, over or inside, let's say, or, or um, really, really close to um, uh, protected areas. <coughs> Now, the, the expansion of the uh, mining operations also affected the protective woodlands of the Andean and Northwest of the country. And the Amazon region is not the only uh, bio biodiversity hotspot of the country, but also uh, those uh, protective woodlands. At least 30% of them are currently under concession, 
and they have a huge biodiversity. Um, a recent study um, over four of the threatened reserves, there are much more, but this was a study about just four of them, found that they shelter at least 269 rare species, including four critically threatened, 37 threatened, and 140 vulnerable. This map um, represents this overlapping between uh, important uh, building biodiversity areas and mining concessions. On purple, you can see how they are severely, uh, severely overlapped in different regions of the country, including the Cordillera del Condor, but not just uh, in the south of the country. Okay, so now let's just do some conclusions. Basically, first of all, that inspired by a new constitution, the Ecuadorian state designed a development plan that aimed to overcome the country's economic reliance on fossil fuels through its replacement with high value added economic sectors. Uh, most of them, not all of them, because there was some uh, conventional industrial policy, but most of them linked with the country's biodiversity. In practice, this meant the investment of extractive rents on infrastructure, infrastructure and human capital. Um, uh, as a result of the oil range, uh, the country decided to increase uh, its public debt and the expansion of the extractive frontier. Those two um, decisions were connected to the extent that in order to, uh, the, uh, to um, fulfill its uh, new uh, financial commitments, the country uh, needed a new uh, public income, and the easiest way was to uh, extract rents. Um, a key problem is that uh, this uh, expansion of the extractive frontier happened over key biodiversity areas, something that endangered the material base of the ambitious economic model, um, specifically its biodiversity. Then one can say that the implicit approach of the development project was uh, what one can characterize as weak sustainability that assumed that losses in critical natural capital, in this case biodiversity, can be com compensated by gains in human and human-made capital. Uh, furthermore, despite the key role that biodiversity was supposed to play in the vision of sustainable economy, the identification of the hotspots of biodiversity and its protection were not integrated within the planning process, which can be uh, characterized as a, as a huge uh, a shortcoming. Uh, and finally, I think this is a key idea, a key challenge for further sustainable development initiative for Ecuador is uh, the financing of public investment. Uh, a progressive tax reform seems to be a feasible part in that uh, direction. That will be all for my part. Thank you very much.